Hi everyone, today we're going to be discussing pathogens and infections of both the circulatory and immune systems. Just briefly today, um, we're going to cover the circulatory and the lymphatic systems and the locations in which infections can occur. We are going to go over sepsis and septicemia, which are bloodstream infections. So that will be infections of the bloodstream right here with septicemia. And then for the three different pathogens that we're going to cover today and their infections, these are all going to be examples of zoonotic infections or infections that are um, vector-borne diseases. And so our vectors associated with each of the diseases, for the plague, we've got the flea, one insect vector. For Lyme disease, we're going to have our tick. And for malaria, we're going to have the mosquito. So as we cover each of these pathogens and the infections that they cause, you'll note the five important things. And then under the additional information or the extra fun facts, one thing to note will be the insect vector associated with each of these three infections. All right. So the circulatory system is also referred to as the cardiovascular system. Circulation or circulatory refers to the function, which is to circulate nutrients and oxygen throughout the body. Cardiovascular refers to the anatomical structures. So cardio refers to the heart. Vascular refers to the blood vessels. And then, of course, within the blood vessels, we have the blood. So the three major components of the circulatory system includes the heart, the blood vessels, and the blood. And the blood includes the water-soluble portion, which is the plasma. And then, of course, we have our three types of blood cells. And to review these, go to Unit 3. And remember that all of the review questions on your final exam will relate to the current terminology. So if you see a word that you've learned about in a unit previous, go back to that lecture slide or your notes about this topic and review what you know about it. And what we know about blood is that there are three types of blood cells, the red, the white blood cells, and the platelets. And those are called the erythrocytes, the leukocytes, and the thrombocytes. And then within the white blood cells, we have several different other types of blood cells. <clears throat> okay, so in terms of where infections can occur in the circulatory system, we have the heart itself. So if the endocardium, which is a muscle layer on the inside of the heart, um, like the heart valves are part of the endocardium, if the endocardium is infected, then it's called endocarditis. If the tissue layer that surrounds the heart, that's called the pericardium, if that gets infected, then we call it pericarditis. So the um, heart itself can become infected. The tissue surrounding the heart can become infected. Um, the blood vessels themselves don't necessarily get infected, but oftentimes the bloodstream can get infected. And so if the bloodstream is infected, we'll call that septicemia. The lymphatic system will also be a part of this lecture. Um, the lymphatic system is a separate system of vessels that get the fluid within is called lymph, and that lymph gets filtered by lymph nodes. So the lymph nodes might get infected. That is going to be the case in the bubonic plague. Um, and the lymphatic fluid is returned to the circulatory system fluid just prior to when um, the blood from the um, one of these veins right here enters the right atrium. All right. All right, so to review the host defenses of the circulatory system and the lymphatic system, it's going to include all of the cells of the immune system because they are actually circulating in the blood and the lymph fluid. So the circulatory and lymphatic system is a hot spot for host defenses because that's where the white blood cells are. And as you know, white blood cells are referred to as leukocytes. 
And there are many different subtypes. We've got our lymphocytes, which are B and T cells, monocytes, which include the um, phagocytic cells, macrophages, and dendritic cells. And then our granulocytes are the neutrophils, basophils, and eosinophils. So let's review which ones are phagocytic or perform phagocytosis. Those would be the macrophages, the dendritic cells, and the neutrophils. These are all of our cells that are phagocytic. Okay. And so this is a typical um, complete blood cell count. Um, white blood cells are much less than red blood cells um, in, our, in our blood. So red blood cells to review, these are called erythrocytes. And our platelets are called thrombocytes. So if you ever go to get your blood work done, um, you'll notice that lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, basophils, and neutrophils are all counted as part of the major types of white blood cells. And our neutrophils are usually um, the, the most common white blood cell that we'll find of all of the different types of white blood cells. Um, lymphocytes, again, include our B and T cells, and then our monocytes are less, and these include our macrophages and dendritic cells. And then eosinophils and basophils are usually found at much lower concentration. And so if you have a general infection, usually your neutrophil counts will be way up. Um, if your eosinophils and basophils are high, then that could be inflammation. Monocytes and eosinophils being high, I'm not sure what this could indicate. It could indicate some sort of warm parasite um, or <clears throat> another type of autoimmune illness or perhaps some type of infection. So not sure what that indicates. All right. Um, in terms of the microbiome of the bloodstream, there should be no normal microbiome. Um, as we discussed in Unit 3, some of the organs and tissues that should be sterile include the heart, the bloodstream, um, or the circulatory system fluid. So the circulatory system should be sterile, and there should be no normal microbes. All right, for our first infection, we're gonna talk about sepsis. Sepsis is the overall um, term for any type of infection. So this infection could be microbes actually in the bloodstream actively dividing, or it could be their toxins. So an example would be endotoxin. Like when Neisseria meningitidis causes meningitis, if the endotoxin from that gram-negative pathogen gets into the bloodstream, then it causes sepsis. So sepsis is the overall term to refer to any bloodstream infection. Either the blood is infected by the microbes themselves that are dividing and growing, or their toxins have been released into the bloodstream from another area. So septicemia is strictly the um, presence of microbes in the bloodstream. So they have to be actively dividing. And if you recall, that active cell division occurs through binary fission, and it would be the log phase of that growth curve. <clears throat> the cause of septicemias are usually bacterial. Um, Gram-positive bacteria can get in the bloodstream and cause infections, so can gram-negative bacteria. But there are some cases causes by caused by fungi, and there are even some cases caused by viruses. So we can call a septicemia for what it is caused by. So bacteremia would be a bacterial septicemia. Fungemia would be a fungal septicemia. Um, and viremia would be a septicemia caused by a virus. All right, so the difference between septicemia and septis is very little. Sepsis refers to um, the microbes or their toxins. I should say, and or their toxins in the bloodstream. Septicemia refers to just the microbes in the bloodstream. 
All right, so then what's septic shock? That's a third term. Septic shock is the physiological result of either of these two. So either of these can result in septic shock. So this is what happens to the body as a result of sepsis. Uh, if it's caused by endotoxin, then we call it endotoxic shock. Uh, for example, um, the type of shock experienced if the meningitis endotoxin gets into the bloodstream would be called endotoxic shock because it's caused by a gram-negative bacterium that has shed its endotoxin into the bloodstream. And remember, endotoxin is synonymous for with lipopolysaccharide. So symptoms and signs of sepsis include fever, chills, shaking, rapid heart rate, shortness of breath, confusion, disorientation, pain, and discomfort. If it reaches septic shock, this is when the infection is, can quickly become deadly. Uh, patients will experience a rapid drop in blood pressure, which will result in an even more rapid heart rate and shortness of breath. Reduced circulation is a result in that drop of blood pressure and also a reduction in urine output. This will soon result in organ failure and then death. Most um, cases of sepsis come from an initial infection that is somewhere else. So sepsis can come from a lung infection like pneumonia. It can result from a meningitis infection. It can even come from a skin infection or strep throat. Remember that one of the com uh, complications of strep throat was when the heart valves got infected. That would be a type of endocarditis that we called rheumatic fever. Um, and so if the heart valves get infected, then those bacteria can also get into the bloodstream. And urinary tract infections, if left untreated, can also cause septis, sepsis. So the number one way to prevent sepsis is by treating these infections. And strep throat is always going to be bacterial because streptococcus refers to strep. Um, there are some cases of viral pharyngitis, but if you see those white spots on the lungs and you smell that gross bacteria smell that you all know from lab, um, then it is a bacterial infection. And then also urinary tract infections are always caused by bacteria. Um, we'll see that next week in class. So if you have an infection that is caused by a bacterium, it is very necessary to get that infection treated, usually through antibiotics, so that the infection doesn't result in sepsis. <clears throat> sepsis can be treated with antibiotics, but it's risky. The reason it's risky is if the pathogen is gram-negative, the antibiotics will kill the gram-negative bacterium, so the bacterium will be killed by the antibiotics, but the gram-negative bacterium will be more likely to shed its endotoxin into the bloodstream. So antibiotics um, can have a harmful effect more so than if antibiotics weren't administered, especially if the pathogen is gram-negative. So antibiotic treatment could cause more um, endotoxin release from those gram-negative bacteria if they are killed. So sepsis is um, very common, especially in hospitals. Those that are in healthcare settings or in hospitals are at the highest risk. And if you have been to an emergency room or a critical care unit, you will see signs for preventing sepsis all over the hospital. There are 1.7 million cases of sepsis every year in the United States and almost 300,000 deaths. 
And so this is far more than the number of deaths caused by any other type of bacterial infection. Sepsis accounts for a lot of the deaths that we see in hospitals. So in all deaths that happen in hospitals, one out of every three is because of sepsis and septic shock. Um, High-risk individuals include those in healthcare settings, but especially those over 35 years of age and those that are less than one year of age with, that have not built up a proper immune system yet. People with chronic health conditions or weakened immune systems are also at a high risk for sepsis. Okay, we're going to move on now to our uh, pathogens that are associated with insect vectors and the diseases that they cause. So the first disease we're going to talk about is the plague. And this is caused by Yersinia pestis. So Yersinia pestis is quite a pest in that it causes the bubonic plague or the Black Death. The um, bacterium that you see here is a gram-negative bacillus. So here we see our rod-shaped cell, which means it's a bacillus. Because it's gram-negative, that means, yes, it does form endotoxin or lipopolysaccharide as a virulence factor. It is a member of the Enterobacteriaceae family, which you have a lab on this family. This includes E. coli and Klebsiella and some of the other um, microbes um, in that lab. Proteus, um, Citrobacter, probably the most well-known Enterobacteriaceae is E. coli. So Yersinia pestis is a relative of E. coli, and it does form capsules. Because it's not in either the Bacillus or Clostridium genuses, um, it will not be an endospore former. So there are three types of plague that I'm going to discuss. Um, the septicemic and the bubonic plague refer to the lymphatic and the circulatory systems. Um, the bubonic plague is what you see here with these swollen lymph nodes that were called buboes, and that's where the name bubonic plague came from. So the bubonic plague is an infection of the lymph nodes with this Yersinia pestis. Septicemic plague is when the plague gets into the bloodstream or when Yersinia pestis causes septicemia, which is a bloodstream infection. And then pneumonic plague, which has a 100% death rate. Um, pneumonic plague is when the lungs get infected. So all forms of these plague are um, serious and the septic septicemic plague is what will likely result in death. But of course, bubonic plague can become septicemic. Pneumonic plague can also become septicemic. The um, recent, not recent, the outbreak in the 1300s was referred to the, as the Black Death because of the extremely high number of fatalities. Um, if left untreated, um, it is 50 to 80% fatal. Uh, cases of pneumonic plague are 100% fatal. So a very high mortality rate or fatality rate if untreated. But this is a bacterium. So uh, we didn't have antibiotics available in the 1700s, but we do now. So the infection is treatable with antibiotics. And if treated with antibiotics, the fatality rate is still pretty high. It's about a 10% case fatality rate with antibiotics, which is still pretty high. All right, so I'd like to go over some of the plague pandemics throughout history. Um, the plague is probably the most famous infectious disease of all of history. There have been three major waves of plague in the world. The first is thought to have occurred in the 6th and 7th centuries um, and resulted in a 50% reduction in the population. 
um, of all people, not just people that were infected. So 50% of people within Europe, potentially Asia, had died from that first wave of the plague. The plague that we saw in the mid-1300s, which is shown right here, um, had traveled along shipping routes from Asia and also along the Silk Road from Asia as well. And um, the Black Death referred to the blackened color of the tissues resulting from the septicemic plague. So the tissues themselves would turn black. And um, this, this uh, massive outbreak and infectious disease killed, again, up to half of the population in Europe and in Asia in just under five years, in about four years. So this was the biggest of the three pandemics. It's estimated about 25 million people died um, across Asia and China. The last outbreak was in the 1700s to the 1800s. And so this um, resulted in many dying as well in Europe and in Asia. And what we see here is a famous image that we'll see sometimes in history books. And this was called the Plague Doctor. And the Plague Doctor knew a little bit about the transmission. Remember, this is still before we knew that microbes were the cause of infection. Uh, but they knew that herbs and coverings could keep the mysterious illness away. And so they'd um, pack these beaks full of herbs, wear gloves and masks to prevent the spread of infection. All right, another fun fact about the plague is the famous nursery rhyme or song, Ring Around the Rosie, is about the plague. So Ring Around the Rosie, Rose refers to a lot of the herbs that were used. Pocket full of posy also referred to the herbs that would be kept stuffed in people's pockets. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. And so that refers to um, the graves from all of the um, deaths that had occurred. So not exactly a, a fun song. So the um, way that the plague is transmitted is through rodents or fleas. Rodents are the reservoirs, so rodents would include the rats that would have been on the ships, and fleas were the transmission vectors, so they could take the infection from the rat and then transmit it to a human. And humans could become infected from rats, from the fleas, or also from other humans. So it was transmitted by respiratory droplets, which are um, the um, wet droplets associated with breath, with coughs, and with sneezes. And so pneumonic plague was definitely more associated with respiratory droplets, whereas bubonic and septicemic plague would have been associated more with the flea bites. All right. And again, it is antibiotic... Uh, treatable. And so ciprofloxacin is one of the drugs that was used to treat many plague infections or currently is. And so you should review, look up what the mode of action is for ciprofloxacin. That was on our unit three summary chart of antibiotics. So anytime you see a specific antibiotic associated with an infection, you don't need to know which antibiotic is used to treat which infection, specifically in Unit 4, but if you see the name of the antibiotic, make sure you review the information about that antibiotic from your Unit 3 antibiotics chart. Plague still does occur. Um, and it has not disappeared. This is a graph showing the number of reported cases from 1970 until through 2018. And each dot refers to a county that has had at least one infection reported. So the um, sporadic outbreaks that occur 
um, are likely associated with rodent and flea populations in certain areas. And some, of course, are probably a mystery. And so there um, have been anywhere from zero to 20 cases per year. So it's still a tiny bit prevalent, but definitely not a leading um, cause of bacterial infections. All right, what is more prevalent is Lyme disease. Uh, Lyme disease is very common in the Northeast and Midwest, and it's caused by a spirochete called Borrelia burgdorferi. And so these cells right here are spirochetes. Spirochetes are gram-negative, but the spirochete is a type of spiral shell, so it's a type of spirillum. But what we learned about spirochetes in unit one is that they have a special type of flagellum called an endoflagellum or a paraplasmic flagellum. And it runs throughout the paraplasm of the, uh, um, the space between the inner and outer membrane. So it's an endoflagellum because it's found within the cell or a paraplasmic flagellum. And that is the characteristic of what a spirochete is. Right. Um, it's a very tricky organism to grow in the lab um, because of its nature and its complex nutritional requirements. What is Lyme disease? It is a systemic infection, which is why we're talking about it in the circulatory system. But it doesn't necessarily, it might be carried by the bloodstream, but it infects joints, the nervous system, pretty much all over. So a systemic infection is carried by the circulatory system, and it pretty much affects the whole body. One of the first places that is often infected is the skin, and the Lyme disease is associated with this bullseye rash right here. But not all cases have this bullseye rash. Only about 80% of cases um, will have this bullseye rash present. Lyme disease is not fatal. Um, so you are likely not going to have to worry about death with Lyme disease, but it is associated with long-term chronic conditions. Um, acute symptoms might be fever, malaise, which is extreme tiredness, a stiff neck and a headache similar to meningitis, um, but it's not um, going to be caused by Neisseria meningitis. If it's left untreated, a lot of joints can be chronically damaged resulting in severe arthritis, and there can be neurological complications as well. So think about it. If a patient comes into the hospital and has a stiff neck and a headache, what do you think the cause is? It could be meningitis or it could be Lyme disease. And what are some ways you could figure that out? You could do a gram stain of the bloodstream. Maybe if you saw a spirochete, it'd be indicative of Lyme disease. Uh, remember that to diagnose Neisseria meningitis or bacterial meningitis, you have to sample the cerebrospinal fluid um, to get a sample and see if there are any gram-negative diplococci. So the cell shape associated with the infection would be different. Some of the symptoms may be the same, um, but the, the way you would do the diagnosis would also be different. All right. This graph right here shows the prevalence of Lyme disease in the United States as of um, our most recent fully collected and analyzed year um, available on the CDC. 2008 is the most recent data. Um, it is transmitted through ticks, and so the deer tick or the black-legged tick is the tick that um, these are commonly called deer ticks. And so these ticks are going to be associated with the deer population, and so that accounts for the regional abundance in the Northeast and the Midwest. Because the disease is transmitted through ticks, um, the insect vector associated with this infection 
Lyme disease can only be prevented by avoiding exposure to ticks. And so this can be done with protected clothing. So if you are hiking on a hot summer day, when ticks are really abundant and really out there, make sure you wear protective clothing, um, especially long pants if you're going through areas that have a lot of brush. Um, the uh, insect repellents also help. And make sure your dog is also treated with some flea and tick medication. Um, after taking my dog for a walk on a hot summer day, she loves to run into the grass and sniff in the woods and check your dog when you get home for ticks um, on the moist areas of the skin, usually under the arms or on the head. There is treatment available for Lyme disease since it's caused by a bacterium. Um, you can use antibiotics, but it's a very tricky bacterium and very difficult to treat with antibiotics. So antibiotic treatment is usually very prolonged and might also involve a mixture of several different antibiotics. Okay, our last infection that we're going to be talking about is malaria. This should be italicized. That's my mistake. Remember that in binomial nomenclature, we italicize both our genus and species name. I don't have a species name listed because there are two species that can cause um, malaria. Um, there is Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax, um, and they are two different species of plas the Plasmodium parasite. Um, some infections are associated with um, um, Africa, and some are associated with the malaria infections you might find in North and South America. Uh, so Plasmodium is a protozoan parasite. So let's review what a protozoa is. A protozoan is a eukaryote. It's a single-celled eukaryote, and it does not have a cell wall. There are four types. There are flagellates, there are amoeba, and there are ciliates. Um, but then there's the fourth type that doesn't move at all, and that is called an apicomplexin. So oftentimes, oh, that shouldn't be crossed out, our non-modal protozoa will need to be carried by insect vectors. And the insect vector for malaria is the mosquito. So the life cycle um, starts in the mosquito. The mosquito injects the plasmodium into um, the human body. From the um, circulatory system, the plasmodium is first going to infect the liver. And in the liver, the um, parasite replicates and divides and gets back into the bloodstream. So the mosquito gets the plasmodium into the human body. It goes to the liver and it starts dividing. And then from the liver, um, thousands and thousands of parasites then get into the bloodstream. And from there, the plasmodium will infect the red blood cells. And this is when the danger um, occurs. So the final site uh, before the life cycle continues. So from the red blood cells, of course, the life cycle, if a mosquito bites someone infected with malaria, then the infection goes back to the mosquito or the plasmodium ends up back in another mosquito that has, been, that has bitten someone with malaria. So here we have our red blood cells and here you can see a, a plasmodium parasite infecting one of the red blood cells. What happens is uh, plasmodium must be inside other cells to survive, live, and grow. Uh, once they invade the red blood cells, they eat up all the glucose that is in the bloodstream. They multiply, they scavenge the iron and oxygen, and the host cell ends up rupturing. So essentially what happens is the red blood cells are eaten from the inside out. This is not a good time. Um, our red blood cells deliver oxygen throughout our entire body, and so without oxygen, we get very, very tired. 
Other symptoms of the disease other than that extreme tiredness, which is malaise, will include a high fever and chills. So if we had to summarize what malaria is, we would say it's a mosquito-borne infection that infects the red blood cells. Malaria is not very prevalent in the United States. Malaria infects about 1,500 1, individuals per year. Um, the parasites associated with North and South America malaria infections are less infective than the ones that um, are associated with infections in Africa and Southeast Asia. Worldwide, as of 2018, there were over 200 million cases of malaria. Again, most of them in Africa. And nearly half of a million deaths. The sad portion of that statistic um, is that most of those deaths, 67% of those deaths, were in children. And so when you think about diseases and their impact in the world, um, especially as we're going through a global pandemic right now with the coronavirus, which could infect millions if we weren't taking so many precautions right now. Um, well, it has infected millions. But um, malaria is one of the leading uh, microbial causes of infections and deaths worldwide. And as far as children are concerned, it is among the highest priority. Transmission occurs through the mosquitoes, so the only form of prevention is mosquito control, um, either with insecticides or netting. Um, Anti-malarial drugs. You've seen a lot in the news likely about chloroquinone or hydroxychloroquine, and these anti-malarial drugs um, can be used to treat or prevent malaria. Uh, there are a lot of um, plasmodium species, though, that are resistant to these drugs. And so all, there are other alternatives for anti-malarial drugs as well, um, other than the chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. Um, and there has been a vaccine developed in recent years. It's been tested in clinical trials, and it's um, now being used widespread in a regional study, um, and there's been promise with that vaccine. So if that's something that um, can be proven to be um, safe and, and effective, then hopefully we'll see the numbers of malaria decrease and the number of deaths decrease in, um, re in upcoming years. That is it for the circulatory system. Next up, we have our respiratory system infections. And we will be um, talking about the cold, the flu, and COVID-19. Until then, take care.